our partners on this initiative. So we have Royal Life Saving Society Australia, uh, Commercial Aquatics Australia, uh, OTM Sport and Leisure, YMCA Victoria, um, the Victorian State Government, um, Department of Health and Human Services, uh, Belgravia Leisure, Cleaning Melbourne, um, VACA, Align Leisure, um, our Watch Around Water sponsors, EcoSave as well, and Western Leisure Services. So thank you very much to our partners. Um, today's session is in the aquatic operations stream. Uh, it's a session with the Department of Health and Human Services. So we have um, Rachel Poon, the C uh, senior scientist in the Department of Health in the water unit, and Michelle O'Donnell, who's a health protection officer in the water unit as well. Um, and they're talking about updates to the uh, water quality guidelines for public aquatic facilities, as well as the water quality risk management plan. Um, and just to, I'll cover this off uh, at the start of the session here. Next Tuesday in the stream, we have Lifeguard Health and Fitness Research from Craig Roberts from Royal Life Saving Society Australia. Uh, the following week, we have um, called Recruitment Engagement with Ramsey Husseini, who's one of our um, staff at Life Saving Victoria. Um, we have an in-service train the trainer virtual workshop with Aaron Collins and Roger Abel from Life Saving Victoria, which is a bit of a pedagogy session. And then we have uh, Incident Emergency Management um, with Craig Roberts again the following Tuesday. Um, so today um, I'll just talk a little bit around what um, what we're going to do. So um, we've got Rachel and Michelle from DHHS on the line. Um, I'd just like to thank them both very much for their uh, time and contribution today. I'm sure everyone will find this information very helpful. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand over to Rachel, who is going to um, share her screen and, and present from her uh, from her office today. And um, yeah, without uh, any further ado, thanks, Rachel, and I'll, I'll hand over to you. So um, thank you, and um, thank you, RJ. And I just wanted to um, thank everyone for tuning in. And um, Michelle and I will kick off shortly, and I'll just share our screen now. And um, Feel free to ask any questions at the end. And if there's anything that we um, can't help you with today, we can um, take it on notice and get back to you. Um, so I will just quickly, sorry, share this screen um, and we'll go from there. So today I really wanted to talk about pool water quality um, and that we're really in this together. Um, we all contribute to water quality and um, we can think about how we can all work together to, to make the pool water quality the best that it can be. A quick overview of um, the presentation today. I'll talk a little bit about some background around aquatic facilities, the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, aquatic facility governance, who does what, roles and responsibilities, the approach we take at DHHS, and then I'll hand over to my colleague Michelle, who will talk through some of the detail around implementation of the public health and wellbeing regulations that came into effect in December of last year, what water quality risk management plans are and some of the work she's doing around training. And then I will finish off with just a quick update around COVID and the impacts on the aquatics industry and finish up with a few of the key messages from today's presentation. So just looking at some of the background around the importance of aquatic facilities, there's certainly a lot of good things associated with aquatic facilities. There's all different types of aquatic facilities from your traditional swimming pools to interactive water features and other up and coming different types of um, facilities. We know that um, swimming and certainly water play is the most accessible form of exercise, regardless of your age, your user ability, your health status, like everyone can partake in swimming and water related um, recreation and exercise. And um, as I guess a assessment by Royal Life Saving Society in 2017, looking at the economic benefits of um, Australia's public aquatic facilities found that each visit to a, a aquatic facility um, results in a economic benefit of $26.39. So every time someone visits one of your aquatic facilities, that is the economic benefit that it brings. Um, so that, that's a really, I guess, powerful analysis of the importance of our aquatic facilities. Another 
good thing that is um, associated with aquatic facilities is how they are maintained and looked after by um, aquatic facilities and staff and, and us as users of aquatic facilities. And certainly there's testing, there's treatments in place um, to maintain water quality. And then lastly, I just wanted to touch on and thank you guys in, as an industry as well for contributing to the development of the new um, public health and wellbeing regulations. Um, over the last 18 to 24 months, we have really got a lot of feedback and actually worked quite closely with the aquatics industry and local government to shape what these regulations look like. So this is something that you know we're really proud of and happy with, and um, we hope you are too. So next, looking at some of the um, not so good things that are associated with public aquatic facilities. Um, unfortunately, a, um, a fact is that we all have traces of poo on our bodies at any given time. And unfortunately, um, if we don't wash with soap before we jump in the pool, um, these traces of poo wash into our, um, our swimming pools. So we know on average there's about 0.14 grams of poo on our bodies at a given time. And um, our little friend here, which is um, this image is of a cryptosporidium oocyst. And um, this is, I guess, a great foe of the aquatics industry in that this bug is very hardy. It's resistant to chlorine and it tends to cause um, all of us some headaches in um, outbreaks of illness that are associated with aquatic facilities. So um, what we're all aiming for is for everyone to wash with soap before jumping in the pool. And because this doesn't happen, we, um, we do get cases of cryptosporidiosis. So that is the illness that's caused by cryptosporidium. So I know this is quite a busy graph. I just wanted to highlight um, in this graph which is showing the number of cases of cryptosporidiosis that are notified to the Department of Health each month. Um, but what I would really want to highlight is that there are years um, such as this grey year in 2009, um, 2013 and also in 2017, pretty much every four years um, we see big outbreaks of illness that um, impact on the state. And unfortunately, um, most of these outbreaks are associated with aquatic facilities. So if you look at this um, graph here, um, it shows the um, number of cases or number of outbreaks of cryptosporidiosis. And in blue, um, the bars show that those are the outbreaks that are associated with aquatic facilities. And in purple, they're the outbreaks that are associated with childcare settings. And they are the two main causes of cryptosporidiosis, cryptosporidiosis outbreaks in Victoria, or then they're the main um, links that are um, shown to spread cryptosporidiosis anyway. Um, so I guess the last thing I wanna talk about is um, we all are guilty of this. Um, particularly us at the department as well, in that we all have our own remit in what we are tasked to do. So, you know, we are tasked with water quality and setting the regulations and the governance around that. There's other areas like WorkSafe that are responsible for OHS, um, the aquatic facilities that are responsible for managing their um, facilities safety and a whole range of other things. So, what we need to do is probably work closer together and maybe be a bit smarter in how we can be world leaders in how we design um, and manage risks. And, um, and that's something that we can probably work better on. But lastly, I just wanted to touch on the ugly. Luckily, we, we don't have um, any deaths or um, serious outbreaks of disease that cause deaths associated with aquatic facilities. Unfortunately, though, I just wanted to highlight in this slide that it does happen. Um, there was a girl that did die after visiting a surf park in Texas um, last year, and that was from a brain eating amoeba, which um, is, is really quite sad. And if water quality was, um, I guess, maintained in accordance with, say, the regulations we have here, that wouldn't have happened. So um, I guess a commendation to the Victorian aquatics industry in making sure that these sorts of things don't happen here in Victoria anyway. So I guess I really wanted to highlight that we do all contribute to water quality, regardless of your role, 
um, or your particular responsibility. We all have a role to play, whether you're a member of the public, whether you're a parent supervising a child, whether you're a swim teacher, an aquatic facility operator, um, or an environment, environmental health officer. We all contribute to water quality and we share the pool. So um, I think that's something that we um, really need to have in the back of our minds in um, all the work that we do. So looking a bit closer at the governance of Victorian aquatic facilities here at DHHS, we certainly are responsible for the development of legislation and policy. Um, we are tasked with the review and development of the Public Health and Wellbeing Act and the associated regulations, which we have spent the majority of our um, time doing. We also provide guidance to facilitate compliance, um, such as the water quality guidelines, and we um, monitor and investigate outbreaks, and this is done by our communicable diseases colleagues within the department. Local Council are the regulator of aquatic facilities. They facilitate, monitor and enforce compliance with the regulations. And as of December of this year, they will also register aquatic facilities, um, category one aquatic facilities. And they typically have um, routine inspections of aquatic facilities for compliance complaints and um, also for registration down the track. And then there's also responsibilities for aquatic facilities in that they provide a service and they're responsible for the well-being of both their visitors and clients as well as staff. Um, and they have a range of different um, pieces of legislation that they need to comply with as well as Australian standards and industry best practice. So looking a bit more closely at the approach we take here at DHHS, we do try to take a multifaceted approach rather than just put all our eggs in one basket. We do have um, a range of different measures to address um, water quality and manage public health risks. Looking at the REG framework, um, I've mentioned that we've got the Act and the regulations. Um, we have a range of um, response procedures to support risk management by um, aquatic facilities. So this includes our cryptosporidiosis outbreak protocol, um, the water quality guidelines, and also our incident response procedures, which were updated um, and released in the water quality guidelines, but have also been updated on our website. We also try to provide leadership and education to both the industry and local government. Um, this includes our Healthy Swimming um, campaign, which continues to involve in doing trials at um, various facilities across the state to try and optimise some of the messaging and just see how we can try and change the behaviour of pool visitors to um, help support better water quality. And lastly, as I touched on earlier, we do have, um, I guess, uh, work to do in terms of our stakeholder engagement, not only working with other government departments, but also working with industry and um, industry professionals and how we can um, work towards, I guess, best practice pool design. So the Public Health and Wellbeing Regulations um, were released in December of last year, as I mentioned, and the key changes were um, broadening the scope and clarifying the definitions of aquatic facilities and um, taking a risk-based approach in categorising higher risk facilities, such as Category 1, and um, having requirements for Category 2 facilities. There's also a requirement for registration. This is for Category 1 facilities only. And um, the water quality requirements remain largely unchanged. There are a couple of minor changes, um, which I'm happy to talk through down the track if anyone has any questions. There are a couple of new duties. So there is a duty to manage risk to human health. There's responsibilities for the aquatic facility operator to do that. Um, and there's also, I guess, um, references to the water quality guidelines as well in the regulations. There's outbreak and microbiological non-compliance procedures that are outlined in the regulations as well. And um, there's also additional powers for authorised officers to issue penalty infringement notices to support compliance. The water quality guidelines for public aquatic facilities, these 
guidelines have been designed to really support the regulations and they detail how to manage water quality. They are currently being updated um, to incorporate the changes in the regulations and we've had a range of feedback from um, industries that we're working through and um, as some of you know that we developed these guidelines in collaboration with Queensland Health so we will continue to um, work with Queensland Health as well in the updates. So this is so that these guidelines are still um, in place at the moment. We are currently working towards a revision. So I might hand over now to Michelle, who will um, talk through implementation of the regulations. So I'm sorry, I'm just going to hand over control. How do I do that? Um, Michelle, do you, can you request control? Or? I have requested control. Okay. Yep. Just requested it. Perfect. Great. So, sorry, just, um, there we go. Did that work? Um, no. Nope. So just excuse us for a second. If if not, Michelle, you can um, share your screen as well. Okay. Uh, I might quickly try one more thing. I'll just stop sharing. I'll just do, sorry. Do you want to try a request? Sorry, guys. Bear with us. Um, okay. Do you have a control down, Michelle? Don't go to the slides. Does is that working for you? Oh no. Hmm. Oh yeah. Um, no, it's not. Which is funny because okay. it worked okay. yesterday. Um. Do you just, I can talk to it, Rachel, if you just want to do them. <clears throat> okay, all right. Yeah, perfect. let's do that. I will just okay. go back to Teams. Sorry. I think we're all coming to terms with this online working. <laughs> okay. So, good morning, everyone. I'm My name is Michelle O'Donnell. Um, I'm working with Rachel and I'm on the implementation team for the regulations. Um, understanding that this is a relatively new concept for some of the facilities. Um, next slide, Rich. Sorry. So really, when you ask what support is being provided to the industry from the DHHS, um, we, with risk management, we are developing a uh, water quality risk management plan template. Um, we were also developing a guide to support, support the development of your risk management plan. So this guide will actually help you to um, develop your plan and what to include in it. Um, it will give you just hints and tips of what you need to look at. Um, and on top of that, we also have seven completed water quality risk management plan examples. So we've had someone from industry go out and assess different types of facilities and actually complete a plan for each one of them so that you do have a reference point when you are um, developing your own plan. We're also um, supporting you through training and support. So we are working um, to develop resources to assist local council and aquatic facilities. With the local council, this is in the form of the environmental health officers. We're working with LSV to develop a um, new course so that it will support the EHOs in um, being able to assess and actually provide support back to facilities. Um, it will just really um, support them in their information and develop their learning about um, facilities so that they do have the knowledge to be able to assess and facilitate you. Um, then the water quality plan risk management examples. So what, what facilities have we inspected? Um, we have looked at an aged care facility, um, an apartment complex, a seasonal aquatic centre, a hospital pool, an interactive water feature, a learned swim pool and a schools pool. Now, the reason why we have um, completed examples of these is that we are aware that 
larger facilities will have their own risk management plans or they will have something in place. Whereas this is just to support those facilities that this is a new concept too. They may have not have ever considered such a thing. Um, so we just want to support them in their development of their plans. So next slide. Uh, so really, when you ask, why do you require a risk management plan? You know, you've been going along, everything's been fine. Um, you know, why, why do you want one? So, well, it is a requirement of the public health and wellbeing regulations, and you do need one to register category one facilities. Category two facilities should also have them, um, but as they're not registering, it's category one that registration requires it. It the plan will outline how your aquatic facility maintains water quality um, to protect public health and ensures your quality is made of your system is maintained and also the reliability as it documents this and allows you to um, act before incidents occur. It helps you to identify potential hazards and measures to control these hazards and provides a systematic document process for identifying risks. And it also allows you to communicate risk to upper management or you know, externally. Um, so, you know, you probably know all of this stuff, but it's just really the risk management plan is going to document it all for you and consolidate it into one area. Um, so then, next slide. So the regulation, regulations require you to demonstrate. Number one, it's really your duty to minimize risks. An aquatic facility operator must manage the risks to human health arising for pathogenic microorganisms in the water in the aquatic facility in accordance with these regs and also the water quality guidelines. Under this, there's a number of sub-regulations that you also need to um, demonstrate that you actually are adhering to. Um, so how are you supposed to do this and how are you supposed to demonstrate and document and actually be able to show an environmental health officer on inspection that you actually are adhering to the regulations and you are implementing them. Um, well, one such way is to use your water quality risk management plan. So when we step out a water quality risk management plan, there's nine different components that you'll need to address. Now, most of these, you already have them. Uh, they might be sitting in different pieces of paper in isolation, and the risk management plan is just going to consolidate them all together. So you need to, you know, outline your staff roles and also their response responsibilities. You need to include a description of your facility, your source water and your treatment systems. What water quality targets do you have? What treatment objectives? What, what do you operate to? Do you operate just outside the, inside the regulations or do you actually have um, a buffer zone for yourself? Hazards, what hazards do you have? Have you identified them? Do you have controls in place and what risks do they pose to your, to your facility? You need to identify those control measures and actually understand and uh, validate that they're actually working. Your operation and verification monitoring. Um, how often do you do it? Is it documented? Does everybody know um, how often you need to do it? Um, your competency, your training requirements. When someone starts, what do they need to do in order to operate your facility so that you do not have any risks associated with it? Um, and just really also your data recording and reporting. Where do you record your data? How do you report it? Um, and your incident response procedures. Is everybody aware of what happens if there is a fecal contamination event? Do they know what to do? Are they, are they trained in it? So really the risk management plan steps out and outlines in that one document how you actually and how your facility is able to do this. The purpose is really when someone new comes to your facility, they should be able to look at your risk management plan and understand everything about your facility. So it's just really a, a consolidation of everything you're currently doing and documenting it. Next slide. So really, if we do a summary, I just created this little infographic to try and outline it because it is a bit overwhelming for those of you that have never had to um, apply this concept before and it can seem a bit daunting. So really the staff roles and responsibilities. This is, these are all the areas that we're going to address when we develop, when we release our template. Um, so you'll have your staff roles and responsibilities. We'll incorporate the facility information, what your water quality targets are. We'll incorporate a hazard and risk assessment, uh, an operational and monitoring program for you. 
uh, the training, incident response, data recording and audit and review. So we'll address the, those all in the template that we will be providing. Um, how we will do that is through these different templates. So, uh, we'll be providing you with a roles and responsibilities and duties register, uh, as well as you know templates for your pool and your facility. Um, the trigger action response plans, we'll talk through that at a later stage, but that's just going to outline your water quality targets, um, your risk register, your program and your training matrix, um, and also your protocols. So in addition to this, we will also be providing um, additional forms and documentation that, although they're not mandatory to include in a risk management plan, you actually do need them to enact your plan. Um, for example, with incident response procedures, if there is a if there is an incident, we are provo providing you with a document, um, a form that will allow you to fill out what happens so that you can actually record it and keep it on record that you have those records available to you. So they're just the additional um, forms that we will be providing to you, as well as, you know, something like a pool monitoring log form, which you would use every day. Um, but again, it doesn't need to be included into the plan, but you do need to refer to it. Um, so then my our next steps are in relation to the plans are to um, really just publish the template plan and the guide and the toolkit. Um, hopefully, I'm really hoping this will be done in the next four to six weeks. It's just this whole COVID thing has set us back a bit. So um, it, it is there. We do have it. Um, and we're just really putting the final touches to it. Um, we'll also be continuing to develop uh, materials and resources to support the aquatics industry and local government. Um, we're really excited about this course that we're developing with Lifesave in Victoria. Um, and then we will be providing support to um, develop your water quality risk management plan and you know how to do the hazard identification and risk assessment, which also I think the, your, the templates that we will provide to you, the completed templates, will actually help you a lot to do that forward thinking as to your hazards. So that's all from me, everybody. Thank you for listening to me. And any questions, yeah, again at the end or through our water inbox. So Rachel, uh, I, I assume that you're going to keep going here for a little bit. I think maybe Rachel, you might be on mute um, if you just want to unmute yourself. Great. So. Um... I just wanted to touch on some of the widespread impacts from COVID-19 and the um, restrictions on aquatic facilities and the closures. So certainly in terms of, you know, the risk from COVID-19 at aquatic facilities, the pathogen risk in terms of water quality would be low. We design our um, regulations and the water quality requirements, for example, chlorination, infiltration, to address pathogens such as viruses and coronaviruses. So the levels of chlorine in the pool would typically be able to inactivate um, the virus. However, where there is um, contention and um, risk is through contaminated surfaces. And if surfaces are contaminated, then how frequently would they be cleaned and how do we prevent um, other visitors from touching contaminated surfaces? So that um, that risk would be difficult to manage. And also the physical distancing um, requirements would also be difficult to enforce in a pool setting. So um, I guess the current situation is that facilities are closed. This really is unprecedented in that aquatic facilities aren't necessarily designed for closures like this. Certainly seasonal pools have experience in dealing with being offline for long periods of time, but um, in terms of, you know, the typical community facility, this is um, something that they're not necessarily um, tasked with and um, trained for. So there would be short and long term impacts on pools. So I guess our advice is really for you to talk to each other and um, seek professional advice. The 
there could be water quality impacts, particularly depending on what you decide to do during this shutdown period. Um, have considerations around maintenance, um, impacts, staffing, and what sort of monitoring you want to have in place. And also think about considerations when restrictions are lifted, lifted, what you would need to do in terms of reopening. You know, what sort of measures will you have to take to get your water quality back in spec or your temperatures back up? Um, what sort of water quality is there in place um, at the moment or when you reopen? And what testing requirements, whether you need to do a superchlorination to get rid of a biofilm or stagnant water within the system, etc. So there's a lot to think about. Um, so talk to each other and, and get some advice from the experts. There is some information um, sorry, available on the DHHS website around a whole range of Q&As relating to coronavirus. There is some advice around disinfection. So this is more around how to clean contaminated surfaces and um, you know, deep cleanings of facilities, et cetera. So this is the advice for non-healthcare settings, which would apply to aquatic facilities. So this is our last slide, just a, a quick summary um, of the key take home messages from our Prezo today. It's really that we all contribute to water quality at our aquatic facilities. So do your bit to help keep the pool clean. There's an opportunity to review and develop water quality risk management plans at the moment before they're a requirement um, as of December of this year. And for you guys to ensure that your facility complies with the requirements of the regulations. And while currently there's restrictions in place and it really is unprecedented times, we really encourage you to share information, talk to each other, take part in forums like this and seek assistance from industry experts to prevent you know, any long-term or costly impacts on your you know, um, important aquatic facilities. And lastly, I just wanted to thank you for helping keep our pools clean. So that's it from Michelle and I. Thank you, Life Saving Victoria, for the opportunity for us to talk today. If you've got any questions, um, yeah, shoot us an email or fire away. Thanks, Rachel and Michelle. That was um, that was very informative. Um, I'm sure there's a I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that are happy to hear um, some updates and and to hear about this um, water quality risk management plan template and and um, and guide that's coming as well. Um, so if it's okay with you guys, do you mind if we um, if we sort of feel some questions from from the industry and and in terms of logistically how we would do that as I'd ask a question and and unmute for that and then mute myself and you'd have to sort of mute and unmute yourself uh, in tandem a bit like how a walkie talkie works. So if everyone can sort of bear with us, um, are you happy to, to answer some questions, Rachel? Yep, happy with that, RJ. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, so um, so we've got one question um, from from Andy here, which is: uh, Is there a target date for the updated guidelines to be made available? That's a really good question, Andy. We ideally wanted it done like three months ago, but um, it is a work in progress at the moment. So as soon as we get a spare week to uh, finalise everything and then work with Queensland Health, we um, will get it done. Unfortunately, we've had COVID throw us a curveball, which um, a lot of us are spending a lot of time on that at the moment. So um, in a nutshell, we're hoping in the next month or two, but um, but yeah, there's at the moment we're saying in the next few months, just in case. But in terms of the current guidelines, they're still applicable. We just don't have the references to the new regulations in the water quality guidelines. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, we had an, another question from Nara, um, which is just around um, instilling instilling the sort of culture or behaviours um, of washing with soap um, before entering the pools. Um, so obviously, we have you know all most facilities should have, and if if they don't have, they should put it up. There's the um, there's the free uh, resources that you have on your, the DHHS webpage, which is the 
keep our pools clean posters and the um, and you know keeping keeping poo out of pools and all of those sort of resources that are available. But um, I guess the question was, you know, is there any suggestions for how um, this culture can be further instilled in in patrons and or in staff? So that's a really good question, and we've been trying to look into some of the, I guess, um, what's been working well and what hasn't been working well with the swimming program. And what um, my colleague Kelly has been doing is some trials at some of our regional facilities to try and um, optimise the Healthy Swimming campaign and look at what some of the barriers are for why visitors aren't um, showering before or having a quick rinse off before they jump in the pool. And um, I guess some of some of the reasons are that um, it's not easy, like it, it's not very accessible to have a um, pre-swim shower. So the design of the facilities don't necessarily um, encourage that. Um, if they're parents with young children, it's hard to get them to have a quick rinse off before they jump straight into the pool. And um, I guess there isn't also that peer pressure as well. We found that um, people are more likely to have a peer pre-swim shower if they know other people are doing it, but because not, not many people are doing it at the moment, we're starting from a fairly low base. So I think there's a whole range of um, ways we can try and influence this behaviour. And it does start with all of us, um, from the person at reception just reminding, oh, yep, just remember to have a quick rinse off before you jump in the pool, to your swim teacher reminding your students that, um, you know, we have a healthy swimming program and, you know, um, you know, I just had a rinse off before I jumped in the pool, so let's all make sure next week before you jump in the pool, have a quick rinse off. So it's it's trying to get some of that behaviour change. And um, one of the effective measures we found is through educating kids, particularly in swim lessons and the learn to swim classes, is a good way to try drive the behaviour change um, through the adults. So um, I think it does really need to start with the facilities and the facility staff, and then if we can get the kids and the parents um, and start to drive some of the ch behaviour change, then um, that's that's a good way to do it. But certainly we need to be doing more in terms of designing facilities to co accommodate that as well. So um, having a, a more strategic approach at, at a government and industry level is also a really important thing. Yeah, so it, sound, it sounds a bit like we need, a, you know, a, a big cultural change, not just not just um, not just sort of within, you know, staff or anything like that, but but really sort of the broader um, user base for public aquatic facilities. So um, it's an interesting space that we obviously look at in uh, drowning prevention, um, particularly for children and, and and multicultural and and or, you know, those with pre-existing medical conditions or disabilities. We've um, we've been working on yeah a number of campaigns in that space as well and using sort of uh, research and, and 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 evidence to try and to try and figure out how best to get those messages across. So um, it sounds like there's a bit of work there that we can that we can do together. Um, and just if there's anyone out there that's got um, some ideas or they or they've or they've done something a bit differently or they or they've um, they've implemented something uh, in relation to water quality and, and and sending that message of showering before before users enter the water. If you've got any um, anecdotes or or examples, feel free to drop that in the chat bar. It'd be great to um, it'd be great to hear um, from from different facilities what they do and and how they do it. If anyone's doing something and it's been really successful, I'm sure it'd be great to share with the wider industry. Um, the next question is um, is from Matthew. So um, he's referring to um, one daily sample if you have automated monitoring or, or, or what I, ass I assume is the online monitoring. So, so the question is, is it sufficient to have only a free chlorine probe or is it a requirement to have a total chlorine probe in this situation? Um, so I, I, think, I think we can, we might be able to answer that straight away, Matt, in that uh, in the regs it's only free chlorine, uh, I believe, that needs to be tested um, for hourly. Um, but m maybe Rachel, you've got a, a different response there from Matt. So I happen to have the uh, regs in front of me, but we do have requirements around um, the testing frequency of um, 
chemical parameters, and that's around um, the. Sorry, I'm just pulling it out now. Um, okay, so it's around free chlorine and total chlorine at four hourly intervals. And if you've got continuous online monitoring for those parameters, then you can just do the one daily check and the preference is for that to be done before the facility opens each day, just to make sure that your equipment's still working, you've still got chemicals um, in your chemical dispensers, etc. So does that answer your question? Hopefully. Uh, Matt, I don't know if you can, uh, if you can sort of comment in there again to to see if that answers your question. Um, it might be something, Matt, that we, we need to ask offline, but but it, but essentially I think what your question is um, is around the difference between online monitoring and and what we what we call um, sort of validation tests with the photometer. So um, so you need to be you need to be testing both um, and and free chlorine is the one that you need to be looking at. Um, uh, every four hours and then you need to make sure that the combined chlorine which i believe is your your question combined chlorine uh, comes under one part per million at least once every 24 hours i don't believe there's been any change to that uh, off the top of my head um, but it's something that we can look into and, and get back to you matt um tyler has a question here around um working alongside with lsv on a course incorporating the content into the current ato course uh, I suppose I can sort of field that question, Tyler. So, so there's there's new modules um, being developed uh, in partnership with DHHS, um, targeted at environmental health officers and then water quality testing. So, so those the, the ATO course is is a skill set, um, and the units of competency associated with that skill set remain um, a skill set under the uh, Sport and Rec package. So. So that skill set stays the same, um, but there will be additional modules uh, that can be done uh, for EHOs and or um, for those wanting to look at uh, water quality testing. I believe I need to probably check with my training counterparts, but um, but I believe that's the uh, that's the path that we're taking at the moment. No, RJ, that's pretty much it. Here, the normal aquatic technical operator course remains the same. Uh, the one that we're developing is specifically aligned to environmental health officers um, and their role. Um, okay, so uh, that seems to be it for questions. Is there any, are there any other questions from anybody out there if you want to drop anything in? Um, if not, um, we'll, we'll start to wrap up. Um, feel free to drop something in. I can't, I can't see anyone sort of dropping anything in, but, uh, but we might just give it sort of 30 seconds there. Um, I might just jump back to uh, the schedule for next week so uh, and, and, and the following week. So lifeguard health and fitness research, which covers the uh, respond and reach within 30 seconds, the GSPO SV 2.3.2. Um, we've got called recruitment engagement, in-service train the trainer, incident and emergency management. Um, and yep, there's been no, no more questions that have dropped in there. Um, so I'd just like to, on behalf of LSV Fitness Australia and our partners, I'd just like to thank um, both uh, Rachel and Michelle uh, for, for making themselves available today during a, a very busy period um, for the department uh, in the middle of this state of state of emergency, which I, I believe is unprecedented um, for, for those guys. So thank you very much for your time. Um, if anyone has uh, any any questions down the track um, or feedback or suggestions, um, you can email those to uh, the pool safety team at assessments at lsv.com.au. And if there's anything um, for Rachel or Michelle, we can we can certainly pass that on to them. Um, and we'd just like to thank everyone for signing in. Um, tomorrow, we've got our swimming and water safety education session. And then on Thursday, again, we've got our management and leadership session where we'll be speaking to uh, Nick Cox, CEO of Belgravia Leisure, and uh, Caroline Morris, CEO of YMCA Victoria, um, which is a, a session on, you know, starting up and rebuilding after a crisis. So um, we're, we're very much looking forward to interviewing those guys on Thursday. Um, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. If you just hit the hang up button, um, you'll leave the meeting. And uh, again, uh, Michelle's just dropped in. If you have any questions for DHHS, you can email water at dhhs.vic.gov.au. 
and uh, and those guys will get back to you as well. Uh, thanks again, Rachel and Michelle. Cheers. Thank you. And uh, chart, I don't know, I can see you're still online there. I'll get to your, uh, I'll get to your assessment here straight after this. Thanks, mate. 